Perfect. So uh, thanks to everybody in attendance. I'm, I'm really, I'm Adam Dietrich. I'm a cloud research uh, vice president, and I'm really excited about this session. Uh, we've got a, speakers from a couple of great institutions, um, particularly speaking about polling research being executed online. Um, to me, polling is the reason that I'm a researcher today, uh, because polling was kind of my introduction into understanding how uh, our industry collects insights uh, for something that everybody can relate to, which is voting and understanding who's going to win that, that horse race. But they are going to go into a much, much more greater detail than just predicting winners and losers. Um, and even, you know, a, a, little, a little bit more about this uh, the session, which is titled Using Online Samples for Polling Research. Um, there's obviously quite a bit of disagreement about what exactly those problems were that are so commonly associated with the 2020 election. Um, but it does seem clear that online polling will be a part of any future solution. Uh, in the two talks for this session, Emerson College Polling and Atlas Intel will describe what went wrong in many of those 2020 presidential polls and how a combination of methods allowed both of those organizations to produce accurate polls in the last cycle and in uh, either upcoming elections internationally or in the, the US midterms uh, next fall. So with that being said, we'll get started uh, with Emerson polling. Uh, today we've got uh, Spencer Kimball, who is uh, on the, the team there and has been for a long time, as well as Isabel Holloway, uh, to present their presentation, which is titled Efficacy of Mixed Mode National Pre-Election Polling in 2020. So with that, I will turn it over. Well, thank you, Adam. And uh, thank you, everybody, for taking the time on a Friday afternoon to uh, zoom on in and talk polling in politics. Uh, as Adam mentioned, my name is Spencer Kimball. I'm the director of Emerson College Polling and an associate professor in political communication. And I'll be joined today by my assistant director, Isabel Holloway. Um, and she's going to talk to you in a few moments about the overview of what we'll be discussing uh, for the next 20, 30 minutes or so. But I think just from the, the get-go, it's important to remember that we're really survey methodologists who get to work in pre-election polling not necessarily political scientists. And while of course we wanna get our polls as accurate as possible, we're studying a larger field and that's what we're going to introduce you to today. So uh, Isabel, if you'd like to give them an overview. Yep, thanks Spencer. Yeah, as Spencer mentioned, as much as election night is exciting, it's just as exciting for us afterwards to compile all of that data and kind of look at the trends. Um, particularly at Emerson, we use a mixed mode data collection. So that, in the case of 2020, allowed us to compare three different types of modes of data collection. To talk uh, about this more, Spencer will kind of walk us through what the trends in modes of data collection have been between 2012 and today. And then we'll talk about what our initial polling in the Democratic primary showed us about these modes of data collection that we were using. Of course, the Democratic primary was kind of cut short due to COVID. So we looked more at the 2020 general election and our polling between September and November of 2020 and compiled all of that together to look at these trends in mode of data collection. Lastly, we'll kind of walk you through what our initial takeaways are from all of this data and how we've used it in some of the 2021 elections that we've been polling. So if we take a look here at these trends, what we had the opportunity to do is back in 2012, 2016, and during the 2018 midterms, is use some of the large polling outfits, the aggregators, the 538s, the Real Clear Politics, uh, prior to this year, we had uh, Huffington Post uh, pollster, and they would have these public polls out there that we could all look at. And if we take a look at all of those public polls that were published back in 2012, 37% of them were IVR polling, which means that they were automated data collection. Uh, you get the automated, uh, you know, the voice uh, operator, you're touching your touchtone panel to answer that poll. And in 2012 was a time where they just were changing what's called the TCPA, the Telephone Consumer Protection Act, the enforcement of the TCPA, where in 20, it was like a gray area if you could call cell phones with IVR. Um, it became a very black and white area in 2012 where it was not allowed very clearly by the uh, FCC. And so as we take a look, without the ability to call cell phones with IVR polling in 2016 and 2018, 
the number of standalone IVR automated polling decreased considerably. Uh, we're still working on our 2020 numbers, and that's because of the proliferation of all of these pre-election polls. In 2012, 2016, even in 2018, there was kind of you know a hub of, of pollsters, maybe a few dozen that were doing election day po uh, pre-election polling. Now it's it's hundreds, and so for us to be able to compile what all of these public polls are has become a little bit more of a challenge in 2020 than it was in these previous elections. But it still shows us where the trends were in the data collection. So, for example, look at the live operator. Uh, that's what we would call the gold standard of data collection in the industry. And we can see in 2012, 41% of those pre-election polls were live operator. In 2016, it was 18%. And then it bounced back in 2018. So we have to ask ourselves, why did live operator polling have this this change you know ivr polling i can see that because you can't call cell phones and so you're you have a response bias in that we can only um cover you know so much of the the universe that we want to find using that mode of data collection so for a standalone it comes with a lot of limitations so it has to be more of a mixed mode and if you look at 2012 2016 and 2018 that's the increase in mixed mode polling so instead of just using one mode uh, the dual mode or multi-mode uh, version of data collection is certainly a popular trend moving forward if we just look at the 12, 16, and, and 18 numbers. And then we got the online polling. And you can see in 2012, 24% of a quarter of the polls were online. Boom, look at 2016, but then it just dropped. So what happened to our online polling? Well, in 2012, if you actually look at all the polls, they were very good. Um, except for the state of Florida, which was a little questionable, the presidential polling in 2012 had a uh, what we would call a statistical accuracy, meaning that the survey, the poll results fell within the poll's margin of error about 94% of the time. And in our field, we know we want it to be about 95%. So that worked out pretty well. And in fact, all of the modes of data collection in 2012 all worked very well. And so in the industry, people were saying, why am I going to pay for this gold standard, which is gonna cost me a bucket of gold to get these surveys when these online polls are working pretty well here in 2012. So 2016 comes along and it was really SurveyMonkey who kind of uh, overdid it. They did over 300 polls and um, did not do very well in uh, being able to project uh, election day winners. And so the industry really took it and said, yeah, 2016, we got it wrong for X, Y, and Z, but it was those online polls. And that's where we started studying online polling. Uh, we knew in 2016, we're that 9% right there of IVR polling, because we knew how to use an IVR sample to create a um, uh, pre-election analysis, but we also knew that it was severely limited in 18 to 29 year olds. And so we had to come up with a way to get a more representative sample. When we look at uh, the online polling in 2016, 58%, uh, boom, it, it does very poorly. All of the polls do poorly in 2016. They all get about a 75, 76% accuracy. So in 2012, it was 94%. Everyone's thinking the polls are great. 2016, they drop again. They drop down to uh, in the 70s, 75, 76%. All of them were, were poor. We get to 2018. And again, all of the polling was generally good uh, in the 2018 midterm elections at a much higher rate than the, than the 2016. But what we notice is that the online polls still are um, not what they once were because they're being now combined part of the mixed mode polling. And now, of course, we have more modes of data collection. Um, as I said, that we started studying the online polls and in 2018, in, in our polling, we did a study looking at MTurk data, uh, Dynata data, and opinion access data, and compared that and used those as uh, companion pieces with our IVR polling. And that's where we found the, the MTurk data because of its the way the MTurk data is skewed towards a younger demographic and its general representation. It actually matched up very well with our IVR uh, data that's skewed towards the older demographic. And when you put those two kind of extremes together in 2018, we would, I would argue we had some of the strongest polling in the country. 
Um, and what we'll talk about today is how we've now evolved taking a look at other forms of data collection as laws have changed. So as Spencer mentioned, we've always been open to innovation in trying new methods of data collection at Emerson. In 2016, we were using IVR exclusively for all of our pre-election polling. In 2018, we did that study that Spencer mentioned comparing different online panels um, in both statewide polls, congressional polls, uh, to see what online panel best fit our needs as a companion piece with IVR. In 2020, as you, the use of text message uh, pushes to cell phones to take surveys on their web browser became more permissible, we decided to experiment with that in our polling. So all of our general election polls for the presidential election in the different states, we included both all three IVR, online panels, and SMS to web. In our national polling, we stuck with just a combination of IVR and online. Um, and looking forward, we are pretty happy with what our results were in 2020, but we still think that there are even more avenues of data collection that are popping up. For example, Change Research and some other pollsters have started to use web advertisements to recruit um, individuals into their surveys. And that's something that we're also going to look at doing in, in the near future. So now we'll talk more about the Democratic primary. Going into the Democratic primary, we started with the kind of data collection that we were using in 2018. That is kind of pairing this MTurk sample with an IVR sample. As the primaries um, kind of got into swing with the caucuses and the primaries, we decided that we were going to start integrating text messaging into these samples. And so if we take a look at what that early data composition was looking like, uh, as Isabel mentioned, our national polling was primarily using the, the methodology that we came out of the 2018 midterms with, and that's the combination of IVR and online polling. Um, but in 2017-2018, uh, we know that the TCPA uh, was changing its enforcement of text messaging, and so cell phone data collection is obviously a, a very large audience that we wanna be able to access. Uh, outside of having to call them with a live operator. And so uh, when we took a look at these data sets as they were coming in, looking at our national data, uh, if you look back at the Emerson poll compared to other polls, we generally had Bernie Sanders in a stronger position uh, in the Democratic primary. We also had Andrew Yang in a higher position than some of the other polls in the Democratic primary. And the reason was, in, in my belief, is that in the MTurk data, we were able to get a more representative sample of this younger vote that was really difficult to get in other types of panels. On the flip side, the IVR data allowed us, the, the landlines allowed us to find that Biden support. So we were able to kind of track where the Biden support was floating. On the flip side, we felt really comfortable with the online polling. But we also knew that text messaging was going to become uh, part of the data collection mix. So we started using text messaging in 2019, but then we used it for the first pre-election poll as we took a look at the Iowa caucus. And here, in just the text messaging, we could see Elizabeth Warren was the strongest. And what's interesting is that she does perform pretty well up in Iowa, but unfortunately the way the vote counts, which is a conversation for a different topic, um, that's, uh, you know, sh sh the, 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 that, that form of data collection showed uh, it to be strong. Same thing with Pete Buttigieg, the, that mode of data collection could be strong. So we had to ask ourselves, why are we seeing these type of things? And Isabel, if you could go a little deeper into how we could see those splits within those modes. Yep. So if you look at all of these different candidates, remember there are 20 candidates in the Democratic primary, we could see that some candidates were being represented at a higher rate in these different forms of data collection. The IVR data was very reliably Biden. Um, his numbers did shift a little bit depending on how well he was doing in the primaries as they were going on, but we could reliably know that his voters would show up in the IVR data. The Klobuchar voters, uh, you remember she kind of came up, peaked in Iowa and New Hampshire. They were also appearing in the IVR data. They were also being represented in the SMS to web data. 
so were the Tom Steyer voters, which we saw happen really in South Carolina. Elizabeth Warren, as Spencer mentioned, also was really strongly represented on the SMS to web data, but we also saw her represented really well on the online data with Bernie Sanders and Andrew Yang, as Spencer mentioned. Those were younger voters, and in the SMS to web sample, those Warren voters tended to be the more educated voters. It was really interesting because we noticed that Pete Buttigieg had pretty consistent support across all three modes of data collection. That kind of showed us that his support was the most um, kind of moderate, be moderate between all of these different candidates. And you saw how he really kind of shot up in Iowa and New Hampshire as well, which kind of fell in line with what we were seeing there. But as I mentioned earlier, the Democratic primary wrapped up um, in the spring and with COVID happening and everything. So we didn't have too much to look at in terms of all of that data. We decided to focus more on the general election. We wanted to put together all of our polls between September and November for the general presidential election and kind of get a larger sample there that we could draw bigger conclusions from. So for this study, it was just under 20,000 individuals. Half of that data was from our IVR polling, a quarter of it was from online panels provided by MTurk, and 25% of it was through our SMS to web surveys. Really what we wanted to do here is compare the demographic variables, age, gender, race, and kind of see if there was one of those, one of those demographics was overrepresented or underrepresented in all three of these different kinds of data collection. We also wanted to test the accuracy of each mode of data collection. Does it make a difference if you can, if you combine two of the forms of data collection rather than all three, for example? So I'm just going to take a few minutes to walk you through some of the key variables that we thought were, were quite interesting. Take a look at the panel composition or the sample composition of the online panel. Um, and what you see here is online IVR and texting. And this is broken up by our age, 18 to 29, 30 to 44. And we can see that across the bottom. Over on the right, we've got our census data. So that's what we would like our general population to be. Now we understand that this is pre-election polling. It's not general population, it's registered voters. And then of those registered voters, who's actually gonna vote from there. But if I take you back to my earlier comments, we're survey methodologists. We are very interested in, the, in understanding the composition of these panels and samples to be able to do survey work in other areas like COVID hesitant, uh, vaccine hesitancy, um, other topics uh, around the globe. Pre-election polling, in our opinion, is kind of the canary in the coal mine telling us, hey, is this method working or not? Because unlike a, a survey, we do get uh, election results and, and we'll be talking about those in a few moments because those keep us humble. But when we take a look at the age distribution, the IVR polling does exactly what we told you it was gonna do. It was gonna skew heavily towards those over 45, in fact, over 65. Um, but if we take a look at the online poll, you're only gonna get 5% of those over 65. But you're in the flip side, you've got the most representativeness of 18 to 29 year olds. It's 23% of the population. Look at the census. Uh, it's 21%. If you look at the text message, it kind of falls in between the IVR and the online, uh, right? In, so you can see how the text message from an age distribution has a better distribution than any of the other, the other two methods, which is why we are here studying it, because we see the long-term benefit of that. With that said, uh, there'll be other factors uh, that the text does not pick up as well. So generally speaking here, we've got our age. We can see that the online and the IVR are skewed younger and older and the text has the, uh, really get, gets the 30 to 64 year old um, and they oversample the, the 30 to 44 year old. In our next uh, slide on education, this is uh, really important uh, to look at because we now again the general population is not going to vote at, in in the same uh magnitude so 60 what do we got here it's roughly 66 percent of the population does not have a college degree i'm not telling you that 66 percent of the voting population is going to vote because we know people with 
who go to college are much more likely to be registered to vote. People with a college degree are much more likely to vote. So I'm not arguing in this case that this is representative of a, of a, of a electoral turnout. But if we take a look at it from a general population, the texting and the online polls underrepresent high school degrees or less. And if people with a high school degree or less is differentiates from the rest of the population on attitudes and opinions, well, we've got to be careful using text and online samples because they don't represent that IVR, the, uh, that, that group as well. Uh, similarly, even those with some college, we can see that the IVR is capturing that audience at a, at a better rate. However, if you're looking to get college students into your survey, well, the online poll is, is fantastic. You're going to get uh, a, a large majority. And then if you're, uh, again, looking for higher educated, texting would also be a strong um, mode for data collection. When we take a look at race and ethnicity, this is where all of the modes kind of underperform. Uh, great at capturing the white audience, but uh, we can see the white audience is 61% of the general population. So if we're doing population surveys, how do we know which one of these modes that we can use? Well, the online mode, if you notice, is actually the best at capturing the Asian and the Black African American vote um, or individual. And so uh, if we were to do a study in a particular area looking for a particular race or ethnicity, this data suggests where we could find that. Uh, but if we take a look at the Hispanic vote, that's a growing concern for us. Obviously, the Hispanic population is the largest growing, fastest growing uh, minority population in the United States. And we're not capturing them, in my opinion, at the rate that we should. So that's something that we're going to continue to look at and try to improve. The last area that we'll just spend a few seconds on is looking at the where these people are coming from. And I think it's important, as we mentioned, that the online poll is better at uh, capturing uh, those minority groups. They're also significantly better at capturing the urban suburban uh, sample. So we can see here 39% compared to 23 and 29%. On the flip side, your IVR, your landlines, you're going to find those folks out in the rural part of the country. And that's why we have uh, a larger contingency there. So while all of this is very great, we need to look at how our polls actually did and what our takeaways are going forward and how we're going to apply these lessons in our future pre-election polling and also general survey research. And so, as I mentioned earlier, there's a concept that we use at Emerson Polling called statistical accuracy. And what we're looking for is a survey or a pre-election poll to fall within its poll's margin of error. And we've highlighted a couple here to, to demonstrate the differences between the modes of data collection and that there's not a magic formula here that we can use one mode of data collection and everything's gonna be perfect. I think you can see it's a bit of a mixed bag uh, that comes from different styles, different modes of, of data. Our national poll, what we're most proud of, uh, was probably one of the strongest polls out there regarding, and I'm not just talking about the last national poll. If you looked at our 18 months of, of polling that race, um, the national poll numbers held pretty steady to the final difference. As you can see here, it was within two tenths of a point of the national numbers. But then we get into the state polling and and remember, nationally, we were using the, the methodology that we had developed in 2018 of IVR and online. North Carolina, we used the three modes of data collection, and um, we were off by uh, about a point and a half. And then we go down to Florida, and we're using the same general makeup, and we're off by nine points. So you can see a big difference between the Florida sample um, in the distribution of those in North Carolina Look at Georgia, we're talking all Southern states right here. Georgia, we're off by eight tenths of a point. So why is it that North Carolina, Georgia works well and Florida doesn't? And those are things that we've been examining. Uh, Pennsylvania, another example, one that fell within four points of the, of the results. Uh, Nebraska's second district, if we look at, we don't use an online component because the problem with online samples or panels is that it's not as, uh, you know, there's not as much of them 
to be able to access them in some of the more rural parts of the country. So in Nebraska's second district, there really wasn't an online component. We used the IVR in the SMS, in the, in the web to uh, text to web. And, and we use that to capture that younger audience. And you can see there the polling held within about four points. And then we tried the uh, Indiana polling. Now, Indiana outlaws IVR calls. So you can't automate it dial to Indiana and four other states. But uh, and the, in Indiana, in Vigo County, doesn't really have an online population. So in this case, we only use text to web. And we found a total disaster in that technique. Um, uh, we were off by 15 points. But uh, Vigo County was the bellwether of counties in the United States for whatever, 140 years. They, the way Vigo County voted, so goes the nation. Um, this was the first time that as Vigo County went, the nation didn't follow. So uh, the, as you can see, there's lots to learn from this. There's not a magic formula. Oh, in the South, it works this way, or in the, mid, in the Midwest, it works this way. It's that every part of this is very unique. And in fact, it's, it's very new. So we don't have 70 years or 30 years of data collection. We're creating it um, with the other researchers here today. So as Spencer said, we are still experimenting with these three um, forms of data collection and combining them at different rates in different areas that we're polling and will continue to do so. However, there are some preliminary takeaways that we feel like we can confidently say about this data. We feel that IVR continues to be the best method to reach those with a high school degree or less. Uh, the other two forms of data collection simply do not get enough of those voters. It's very important for us to incorporate those voters into to our methodology. That's what a lot of the complaints about the 2016 polling had to do with. So we will continue to use IVR for that purpose going forward. For SMS to web, we find that it has a few different um, benefits to it. It has the greatest potential for reaching a real normal distribution um, in terms of age. It's a little bit light on that 18 to 29 year old, but if you're doing a pre-election poll, you can reasonably expect that that group is not voting um, at their propensity anyway, so we feel comfortable with it because of that. Um, it also does a good job of capturing the older voter. Those older voters are distinct from the IVR voters that we get because they do tend to be more educated, uh, but it's a good comparison point between the two. Um, the SMS to web is most limited in its ability to reach those um, with a high school degree or less, but also those that are in the rural areas of the country. The IVR continues to be better at that. For our online paneling usage, we have to continue using that as well because it has such an advantage in reaching the urban and city populations and specifically looking at race, it was the only method of data collection that we used that captured more than 2% of the sample being Asian. So incorporating those voters and those individuals into our surveys is very important. So online paneling continues to be the best for that. And uh, in conclusion for us, I know we're running up against our time here. As we take a look at 2021, what we've taken is what we've learned so far. So for example, in that New York City primary, we were starting off using online and text to web. And what we we're realizing is we weren't getting enough less educated voters. And those less educated voters were voting for a candidate Adams at a disproportionate rate. And so we mixed that back into the, the, the modes and ended up with one of the more accurate polls out of that Democratic primary. In Boston, uh, we were looking at trying to find, there was an Asian candidate, Michelle Wu, who was capturing a very strong percentage of the Asian vote. And again, the online panel we found to be able to access those voters the best. And uh, once again, those that poll showed um, a pretty accurate representation. And then finally, in California, there's a state that's obviously quite large, largest in the nation. And we don't actually really need too much SMS. The online panel is very strong in a big state like California. And so if we take a look, we could collect most of our, our data online and with landlines. Um, and, uh, and once again, uh, once they finish counting those votes, uh, it'll probably be a 21, 22 point race, which was uh, right in line with what we were looking at. 
And, and I think it's important that we're able to take these, the, even the initial feedback, and we knew that if we didn't fix that in the New York City primary race, we would have underrepresented a candidate. Same thing in Boston. And when we think about the survey industry, political pre-election polling is, is I enjoy it. It's, it's, it's fun, it's exciting, um, but it's only about a fifth of the business of the survey industry. So as we focus and we learn about panels and sample composition, it's very important to remember to apply this now into our survey methodologies as we're studying a lots of other issues around the globe. Awesome. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you, uh, Spencer and Isabel for that. I uh, encourage everyone to feel free to add questions into the chat or into the Q&A and on the conference side. I've got a couple I could ask, I feel like between the three of you, I could ask questions for well through the weekend, but um, for, our, for our folks in attendance who aren't familiar, SMS to web, are you using a voter file and, and uh, appending it to public records phone numbers and asking people that way? Explain us that process just really quickly. So the way that that works is the survey is set up online and then mm -hmm. we do get the voter file and we uh, send out a text using the individual's name, uh, which we get from the voter file. So it would be, hello, Adam, this is Emerson College with a brief survey on the Boston mayoral race. Please click the link below to take. Uh, they click on the link, it opens in their web browser and they take the survey there. Awesome. Thank you. Um, I, there are so many things that I want to go through, but you know, the, the, the crux of, of and the nuance of this, I think, shows how frustrating the public conversation can be about public polling. Um, but one of the things that I think Emerson does a spectacular job at is, is understanding the strengths and weaknesses that you kind of displayed there of each of these individual methods. I want to, to know where you all think this is going in the future. Is online going to become more representative? Is SMS going to be more representative? And are, is, is, does the general polling uh, apparatus at Emerson and, and uh, everywhere else need to be kind of more amenable to these shifting demographics and, and where the easiest place to get potential voters might be? Yeah, I would uh, argue that we got to be thinking of how people are communicating. And, you know, in 1977, people sat down at dinner at 530 and they had a landline and that's how they communicated. Uh, they were, there were more newspapers. That's how people read. We're not, you know, we're in the 21st century. Text messaging wasn't even an option when Zogby started his, you know, IVR polling in the late 90s or the online right. world was dial up. That's how we started a dial up <laughs> online poll is crazy to think. But it's right. those folks that started it that's giving us the opportunity. And without a, without a doubt, I believe that online polls, SMS polls, opt in panels, that's going to be the future of, of data collection. And we just are all trying to wrap our heads around how that's going to look as compared to using a probability sample, random digit dialing of live operators, the cost of that. You know, there's a lot more languages, I, I would argue, being spoken in the United States today than there was 50 years ago. Certainly. And so uh, online and, and digital components make it a lot easier to collect data and translate surveys. Um, into those languages to capture even larger audiences. And that's something that we're dealing with looking at that Hispanic community. Right. Uh, Rachel has a hand up, so I will go to her, or maybe that was unintentional. Uh, no, I, I had a quick question. Um, I was just wondering, and yeah, I don't really know anything about polling, so um, forgive me if this is dumb, but I was just wondering, like, what do you, do you do anything to ensure like data quality at all? Like, do you, uh, check to see if people are just randomly clicking or if they're trying to troll you by um, answering in a particular way or yeah, if you have anything. So there's a couple of different things on that. I'll let Spencer talk more about the online, but an interesting anecdote um, from the New York City mayoral primary that we did, when we did our SMS um, to web data collection, we found um, Scott Stringer was at like 50% in our poll. In all of the other polls, he was at 10%. So we are like, what's going on? And we could go into the data, look at the IP addresses, look at the time that the data was collected, and we were able to identify what was happening. Somebody on Stringer's campaign happened to be in our random sample and spread it with the entire campaign. Um, 
we've had similar things sort of happen in Boston as well. Um, these mayoral races, I guess, get really, really intense. Um, so it's definitely something that we have to look out for with uh, the online and the SMS data collection uh, more than others, but again, it's just a, an extra step in our processes. It's part of the challenge uh, and everybody's playing the game, but I will say the campaigns that we catch doing that, you know, it's fun just to see because it shows you campaign organization uh, that you can instantly take a poll and then bang, you get 70 people to take my survey, but I know every one of those people. and so. Um, that's kind of the rub. We don't like to, to have to have that side of it, um, but you know, there's unethical characters in the game. Um, on the online polls, the, really the biggest issue is when there's money involved, you got an incentive, you're gonna get bots. Um, one thing that's nice to be able to look at is the time, uh, how long it takes. You can put in an open-ended question. It's a great way to figure out who's really answering that. Um, what it's, what is, uh, the research suggests there's the honey pot question. Um, where you, you you can put it in uh, basically in blank font, you know, no font, you know, colored font, and then only bots can read it. And that way, if they answer the question, you know, what bot was involved. Um, so there's constant innovation happening uh, within the industry because it is new and it's, and people do, you know, some people just want to screw up the research for the sake of sake of doing it. Um, so we have to be pretty um, cognizant of that at all times. And when we see things like that, you know, this is the new era. And so um, those changes are, are uh, something that we're, we're constantly thinking about um, and being able to track back who's answering what surveys. Perfect. Well, thank you very much to the Emerson College, Emerson College polling team. Uh, we're going to shift gears a little bit uh, now into our second presentation. Um, also, shameless plug as we're talking about data quality, as always, I'm sure uh, attendees are familiar, but cloud research, we have a, our Century platform uh, that does uh, some unique uh, and innovative things around uh, limiting bots and fraud and those kinds of things as well. So, but with that being said, we are going to the founder and CEO of Atlas Intel, who I believe was uh, 538's most accurate pollster of 2020, uh, Andre Roman, you uh, got started in elections a few years ago and have had good success trying out some of these new methodologies and things like that. So I will turn it over to you for your presentation, which is titled Polling Air. Why were polls so wrong in 2020 and what can we do about it? Thank you so, so much, Adam. Uh, thank you for organizing this uh, very interesting conference and for the opportunity to uh, be here with you guys today. Um, I don't often have time to think uh, so much about uh, many of the methodological um, points that were made today, um, because you know, because of my work, I'm mostly focused on uh, building Atlas Intel, building our different kinds of products. Um, polling error is something that we're obviously very uh, focused on, um, but it so often happens as well that an election uh, passes. Uh, and then we caught up with lots of other things and we um, uh, end up not thinking as much as we should about uh, what just happened with the election cycle uh, we went through. So this is a great opportunity to uh, be here with uh, some of the leading experts in the field uh, and discuss some of these things with you. Um, let me provide everyone with a brief introduction to uh, what Atlas Intel does. Uh, we are a data technology company based in Sao Paulo, Brazil. Uh, we focus on developing um, alternative data indicators, mostly for financial market clients. Uh, a lot of our work is related to politics um, because we do a lot of public opinion research and polling, uh, but we do lots of other things as well. Uh, we have a social media analytics tool called Atlas Monitor. Uh, we are increasing, increasingly working as well uh, on um, tools for um, video intelligence uh, and audience intelligence. Um, we also have uh, consumer confidence indicators going on. Um, and we are increasingly covering the diversity of geography. So we work uh, across Latin America, uh, in the United States, and increasingly in uh, Europe. Um, we are currently, indeed, um, the only web-based company um, in um, the 538 poster ranking with uh, an A grade. Um, alongside uh, this grade, we also 
uh, have distinguished ourselves um, in terms of having a minimal statistical bias. Uh, you won't see uh, our polls skewing um, Republican or Democrat uh, in, a, in an extreme way in, a, in any election cycle that we've covered so far in the US. Um, in 2020, we were indeed uh, the most accurate pollster of the election. We um, ran polls in seven swing states as well as uh, national level polls. Um, and I think we were one of the um, very few uh, pollsters that got uh, all polls within a margin of error, uh, comparing uh, you know the election day result with our last estimate. Um, in, in the case of 538, I think they compare um, the results with polls that were released uh, at, at most 15 days before election day. Uh, in um, the analysis we ran, we only chose polls that were released seven days prior to election because we believe you know a, a shorter time frame is, is perhaps more adequate. Um, our polls uh, at the state level um, were not only more accurate than um, other pollsters, but also than uh, poll averages, such as the real clear politics average, um, or uh, aggregation-based models, such as the 538 model. Uh, and that's also something that we're uh, quite proud of. Um, our last national poll had Joe, Joe Biden win by a, a margin of 4.7 points. His, his final advantage was um, just 4.5 points, um, and that ended up being um, 0 0.2 points different from our last poll. Um, that doesn't mean we got everything right, okay? So, for example, we had um, in Florida um, a result that had uh, Biden winning by a sliver, which was different from happening, for example. Um, there were various polls uh, where we got um, the winner of the race wrong, uh, but it was always within a margin of error. Um, so our performance on average was, was extremely strong in the 2020 cycle. Um, in the primaries, um, we ran polls um, in the most important states. So early on in the, in the democratic primary process, uh, we had the most accurate polls in New, New Hampshire, California, and, and Florida. Um, New Hampshire was a particularly interesting poll at the time because um, uh, Buddy Geek uh, had a much stronger uh, performance than expected, uh, and that was very much in line with what we were expecting. Uh, we believe that polling in New Hampshire may actually have uh, hurt him uh, and, and, and perhaps uh, set a course for the Democratic primary. Um, that could have been different had polls uh, captured uh, with better precision uh, Pete Bobby, Bobby advantage early on. Um, so, you know, we take polling uh, accuracy uh, very seriously. Uh, polls do affect public opinion. There is so much academic research confirming that uh, again and again. Um, public confidence and, and confidence in the democratic process depends on accurate polling. Uh, and so we're happy that we can contribute to this uh, through our work uh, as we have done in the past and as we hope to continue doing uh, from now on. Um, just to talk a bit about our polling outside of the US, uh, you know, our last election cycle in Brazil was that of the 2020 municipal elections. Uh, Atlas ran polls in uh, five large cities, Sao Paulo, Rio, Fortaleza, Recife, and Porto Alegre. Uh, Brazil also has this diversity uh, of uh, polling modes. Um, we are currently uh, one of the only three online pollsters in Brazil. Uh, a lot of the polls here continue to be uh, conducted face-to-face -face, um, and uh, by telephone. Uh, and this is a context in which um, we still were able to achieve the best result in each of these five cities. The most accurate poll was in Atlas and Del Pol. Um, which also suggests, you know, give, give some credence to this surge um, of interest uh, into online methodologies as methodologies that are in, indeed uh, reliable and accurate. Um, 
and it points to the fact that you know uh, what used to be considered the gold standard of the research industry of the pu public opinion research industry um, just a decade ago uh, perhaps is uh, no longer the case or at least not so obvious as it was to to many um, experts looking at this some years back uh, in 2019, Atlas polled the Argentinian presidential race. Uh, it was uh, an extremely uh, volatile race. Um, uh, Alberto Fernandez ended up winning the primaries with a much greater advantage than uh, expected. Um, just to give you a sense of how polls affected uh, the stock exchange market in Argentina at the time, the uh, Argentinian stocks fell 37% percentage points in one day uh, due to the surprise uh, in those elections. No one had expected uh, Fernandez to win uh, with the margin he did in the primaries. Um, and as a result, um, the public opinion uh, polling industry in Argentina took a, bit, a pretty big credibility hit at the time. Um, it was it was an election in which Atlas uh, also came first in terms of uh, accuracy. Um, in terms of <clears throat> our commercial offering, uh, Atlas provides a high-frequency polling tool called Atlas Tracking Pro. It mostly <clears throat> has financial market plans. Uh, you can see here the evolution, the time series we had for the 2019 election in Argentina. Uh, the tool includes all sorts of indicators besides uh, uh, election issues um, and, and politics. We are increasingly focused on uh, economic forecasting indicators. Uh, particularly uh, consumer confidence, uh, inflation, which is an, uh, a very hot topic nowadays uh, in the U.S. and in, across Latin America. Um, I won't um, spend much time on this. Uh, another tool we, we have is Atlas VRC. Uh, this is also um, an interesting uh, uh, adaptation of a polling methodology. Uh, we have respondents uh, look uh, at uh, video content uh, and evaluate it second by second using our um, our website and our apps. Um, essentially, every respondent um, will register an individual reaction curve uh, that will then be aggregated with um, hundreds of other respondents uh, and lead to uh, an overall reaction curve for the entire electorate. Uh, we are able to uh, evaluate all sorts of content using this tool. Um, uh, debates, uh, political ads, uh, and increasingly we're focused on non-political uh, content. Uh, you can see here uh, one recent study we conducted um, on a live um, Facebook uh, transmission by uh, President Bolsonaro. Um, Bolsonaro was um, look, trying to argue that uh, Brazil's uh, Brazil's uh, electronic voting system is not as reliable as it uh, should be, uh, that there is potential for fraud in the upcoming presidential cycle. Uh, it is a, a political discourse that's um, strikingly similar to uh, Trump's uh, ahead of uh, the 2020 race and after the 2020 race, the allegations of fraud. And here we were testing, you know, what are the groups among the electorate that are responding to the different kinds of arguments that the president is making uh, in regards to um, uh, the voting system in Brazil? And you can see, you know, the evolution uh, of these curves um, uh, second by second, and, and therefore you're able to identify uh, certain uh, tendencies, certain local tendencies in these curves. So, uh, what are the messages that determine uh, an increase or a decrease in the approval rate? Uh, across the various groups. Just to give you a sense of, of what Latlas Intel works on when we're not running a, a presidential election poll uh, in a swing state uh, in an American election. Um, so now let me let me turn to the actual uh, substance uh, of um, uh, my talk, which is a polling error in the 2020 race. Uh, we all read the recent APOR report that looks at a uh, polling error. Um, 2020 was a really dreadful year for uh, the, the polling industry uh, in the U.S. I think it, the April report says that it was the worst performance in um, four decades. 
Um, and so we really need to take a, a very uh, close look to the reasons uh, behind this. And we have uh, attempted here at Les Intel to build a perspective um, on what went wrong. We identified uh, three major um, factors that I would like to share with you, uh, and then we, we can discuss them uh, together. Uh, they are differential and response bias, um, you know, an, an inadequate treatment of uh, differential and response bias and what it means uh, for uh, polling accuracy. Uh, turnout, uh, we believe that uh, turnout is always one of the major um, challenges uh, for uh, election uh, polling, particularly in the US, uh, where uh, the, the percentage of the population, of the voting age population that actually uh, submits a ballot uh, is considerably lower than uh, in other democracies. Um, we believe turnout was uh, a considerable factor uh, in the 2020 race uh, for explaining what, why, why so many polls uh, got the results wrong. Uh, and then um, we also see some significant indication uh, of poll herding in, in the 2020 cycle. So these are the three um, the three topics that um, I think are relevant and that, that I'd like to speak about uh, in a bit more depth. Uh, differential and response bias um, is uh, a challenge mm, for two reasons. First, because response rates are uh, extremely low. Uh, they have dropped uh, significantly over the past two decades. Um, by 2018, uh, Pew Research Center revealed that in telephone surveys, uh, the response rate was um, uh, approaching only 6%. Um, the problem with, 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 with non-response bias um, is not just the fact that it's um, increased so much, but the fact that uh, we believe it has, be it has become increasingly non-random or systematic among specific groups. Um, if, if we were simply just seeing more non-response, but that was not associated in a um, uh, non-random way with the behavior across different groups, perhaps it wouldn't be such a big challenge. Uh, the problem is that uh, increasingly certain groups, certain demographic groups, um, uh, refuse to answer um, uh, poll uh, uh, attempts, right? So our polling invitations uh, end up um, with a much greater frequency being accepted by uh, voters with a, with a specific with a specific profile uh, than others. Um, an increasing uh, finding here is that in our uh, polling for most of 2020, uh, we dealt with the opposite of the shy Trump voter effect. Uh, in our polls, uh, Trump sympathizers were answering at a much greater rate than non-sympathizers. So in our case, most of um, our concern for non-response bias was that of not overinflating Trump uh, rather than uh, minimizing his uh, strength. Right? Um, what uh, we have seen, you know, analyzing different data collection modes is that um, this is actually what you'd expect with uh, web polling in a US context. If we were running our uh, polling on the phone, particularly with a live interviewer, we would expect that the non-response bias would actually um, lead us in, in the opposite direction uh, with um, a Trump voters uh, responding at a, at, at a much uh, less frequent rate. Um, so, you know, the, there is a, a, a really big challenge here in terms of understanding how um, different uh, elements impact uh, local patterns in, in your data. Uh, you have uh, the political context and news, the news cycle affecting uh, on, uh, these uh, rates of response. Uh, the mode of the uh, poll affects those, uh, those responses as well. Uh, and then, um, you know, you have uh, more gradual changes uh, that take uh, place over time um, and um, that may continue from one election cycle to, to the other, but that can be masked by some of these other confounding factors. Uh, so differential and response is, uh, in, in our perspective, one of the main reasons for which polls tend to get it wrong when they do uh, in uh, U.S. elections. Uh, Adjusting for it uh, in an adequate way, we believe, helped us 
uh, have uh, a very strong performance uh, in the 2020 cycle. What are some of the things that uh, we try to do in terms uh, of uh, non-response bias? Well, first of all, we try to understand um, where it comes from, right? We systematically investigate uh, response rates across different groups. We try to under, uh, you know, build a decision model for how respondents interact with our questionnaires. Um, essentially, we try to understand um, how um, people deal with uh, polls, right? Why some are so much more um, uh, adamant or are instigated or active in terms of trying to answer them. Uh, there are some people that actually um, actively pursue uh, opportunities to answer polls, whereas in other cases we have um, uh, profiles of respondents um, that will uh, refuse a poll uh, attempt uh, with an overwhelming rate. So there, you know, you you. You can even have a coverage issue where uh, uh, no matter how hard you try to get that, that respondent, the chance of him uh, falling within your sample is extremely low. It's very important to understand these things. You know, what are the actual uh, response rates that we're uh, talking about? Um, what are the elements that influence the, the, those response rates? And, and you, know, you know, more broadly understanding the behavior uh, of the person you're trying to interview. Um, building on that, we have uh, been able to build systematic correction mechanisms for um, uh, non-response bias. We try to um, systematically optimize for respondent recruitment. We try to boost invites for groups that are systematically uh, responding at the, at the less frequent rate. Uh, this uh, solves part of, the, of, of our issue. It's always important to have a critical mass um, of respondents, even in underrepresented groups. Um, and that gets uh, complemented by our uh, post-certification strategies, where we are able to further correct for differential and response by controlling for other dimensions of representativity, you know, other, other things that, uh, you know, could be uh, included in, in the second step that, that I described, uh, and where we also allow for uh, interactions between variables so that we can post-stratify uh, on a more um, dynamic um, uh, approach. Right. Uh, these are some of, some of the things that uh, that we do. I, I cannot obviously go into uh, <laughs> much depth because part of part of what um, uh, we do is is quite sensitive in terms of uh, building our competitive advantage. Uh, but overall, I, I think unresponse bias is is here to stay. Uh, it is a significant methodological challenge for uh, the survey industry in general. The fact that we only see these discussions arise related to um, you know, polling errors in uh, election cycles doesn't mean that this doesn't affect uh, non-political surveys. Um, the, the thing about non-political surveys is that it's just so much harder to figure out um, that they may not be as representative as you'd think, right? Political polls control on the surface for um, target variables of representativity. You're always going to have, you know, uh, in uh, any of, of the polls that are included in uh, the 538 aggregation database, for example, representativity uh, on region, on gender, on um, race, um, sometimes even on past um, uh, decisions of voting, like the recall vote. Uh, and still, uh, these uh, polls end up uh, missing, um, and that should worry us a lot in terms of, you know, uh, surveys where we can't uh, um, verify, you know, accuracy in terms of um, the real truth, the real world truth, right? um, which is why, you know, dealing with non-response bias, verifying this also in, a, in the context of uh, non-political surveys, I think is extremely important. Uh, let me move to turnout. Um, turnout uh, was one of the uh, things that wasn't uh, as talked about in uh, 2016. You know, when when people looked at uh, what went wrong with 2016 polling, uh, a lot of attention was paid to um, you know representativity by um, educational achievement, the fact that uh, uh, non uh, non college educated whites. Uh, were underrepresented.
presented it in the in, in, in the samples. So it ended up, you know, being mostly a discussion uh, of um, you know poll calibration rather than um, you know last minute turnout. Uh, our conclusion on on 2016 was was rather different. Um, you know, looking uh, before 2020 at 2016. Uh, we concluded that actually turnout was perhaps the most important factor leading to poll error in that cycle. Uh, and because of that, that shaped our um, you know, approach to 2020. We believe that uh, turnout continued to be a, a very significant um, element to monitor. Uh, and that's uh, exactly what we did going into you know, 2020. We built into our surveys mechanisms of understanding um, um, turnout mobilization, the, the drivers um, of turnout mobilization across different states, uh, and also um, a ways of, of adjusting those, um, est those estimates, those expectations uh, pretty rapidly when um, you know, our models showed that things were evolving. Um, why do we believe that turnout was so important in, in 2016? It, it really has to do mostly with um, uh, mobilization turnout by uh, race. Um, you know, the, we, we looked very carefully at um, uh, this st study by uh, Fraga, um, Kelly, Rhodes, and, and Schaffner. Uh, what, what they tried to do here was um, you know, model how uh, the margins in swing states would have been different uh, in 2016 had blacks and whites turned out uh, at their historical uh, pattern, right? So if blacks uh, wouldn't have uh, under, uh, wouldn't have been underrepresented in 2016 to the degree that uh, they were in the end. Uh, and what you see here is, uh, some differences that are rather interesting, right? So in states like uh, Michigan, uh, Florida, uh, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, um, this was the difference between having one winner of the race or the other. And these were essentially the most important swing states in that election, right? Um, this uh, is extremely um, uh, strong evidence uh, regarding the impact of uh, turnout mobilization uh, on the outcome of the race. And also as a result, uh, it is extremely uh, strong evidence uh, in terms of uh, understanding uh, polling error in the 2016 race. We have evidence uh, regarding the importance of uh, turnout mobilization uh, and you know, the way it affects polling error um, from other parts of the world. Um, I will show you here a graph uh, from uh, the 2017 uh, legislative election uh, in the UK. At some point, Theresa May decided it was uh, a great time uh, during her bid for Brexit uh, to call an election. Um, the political impact was very different from what she expected. Uh, the public pretty much wanted to take revenge uh, on the pr uh, prime minister for calling that election. And you saw a very rapid um, change in the dynamics of the race uh, in a matter of, uh, of weeks. The thing about this is that uh, evermore, these changes don't happen uh, you know, across months, or weeks or even days, sometimes you see patterns like this happening uh, in a matter of hours, right? We have uh, recently uh, covered the legislative primaries in Argentina. Um, something very similar to this happened uh, in this cycle. We, we had a, a scandal affecting um, uh, the president, the party, uh, the official residence during the COVID-19 pandemic at the time when the government was publicly defending uh, isolation policy, social distancing policies uh, for the general population. Um, more than that, they um, um, pretty much uh, denied the existence of any kind of private event at the official residence uh, on the occasion of uh, the birthday of the wife of the president. And that's exactly what, what happened. Um, we saw a really rapid uh, collapse in the credibility of the government um, but that didn't happen, um, you know, right 
away. It, was, it didn't necessarily happen just, you know, the day after the, uh, the scandal took place. A lot of that was concentrated in the dynamics of the election day, you know, the hours uh, leading into election day and the behavior of, of people on election day. Um, a huge chunk of um, you know left-wing supporters in Argentina just didn't show up, uh, and this resulted in an election where polls got everything terribly wrong, uh, with um, a victory by the opposition that was way more significant than anticipated, and that is very similar to to this graph, right? It's it's um, it's a change in uh, dynamics that is so fast. Um, that it's not even, um, let's say, crystallized in the minds of voters when you poll them, and that makes it extremely difficult, right? Um, this is why, you know, understanding uh, turnout mobilization is so important, um, uh, and also why getting this thing right is is very hard. It's also uh, interesting here that sometimes these correcting for these two effects goes um in different directions right so when you when you when you're trying to correct for a non-response bias you're usually trying to boost um the weight of people that are not very politically engaged or mobilized right uh, whereas in the case of turnout mobilization you're you're trying to do exactly the opposite you're trying to give more weight to those people that are more mobilized more so than than the polls would suggest right so these are two, uh, you know, adjustments that go one against each other, and you know, getting it right is often um, pretty difficult because of that. These are these are, you know, dynamics that go into different directions. Um, how do we deal with turnout mobilization? Well, we try to understand uh, historical patterns. Um, we um, have developed um, ways of predicting uh, turnout. Um, we are increasingly focused on understanding uh, how voting system affects this. Um, in the US, the voting system is changing uh, in so many states in so, so many different ways during the 2020 cycle. Um, you know, going into election day, a huge chunk of the voters of California, for example, had already voted, which made uh, polling uh, harder also because of that. You know, we didn't know in some of these cases how many voters had actually voted, and how many would be voting on election day. Um, so these are some of the things that, that we try to do to understand turnout mobilization. We uh, look at uh, the, the recent past, um, try to see what um, what happened, and based on that, we build a prediction model uh, that is then operationalized uh, through different kinds of, of questions, you know, voter enthusiasm, voter alienation, into our questionnaires. Uh, and then um, that also gets mixed with a more qualitative view of how the voting system could, at the end of the day, affect turnout mobilization. Um, as an afterthought, uh, because Andre, really, not... really quick, Andre, sorry. I know we've got a couple questions in the queue already. So if you could do poll herding pretty quickly, and then I want to make sure we get yeah, to those yeah. questions. This, this, this was more of an afterthought. Um, <laughs> we, we, we don't, you know, look at poll herd. We, we, the, the, we don't poll herd. <laughs> I think, you know, if you poll herd, it's very hard to to come, uh, you know, above of the pack at the end of an election cycle, and that's what we usually try to do. But um, we think poll herding uh, affected the 2020 race in a pretty uh, dramatic way. Um, political polarization uh, affects the incentives that pollsters have in terms of herding. Uh, it increases the risks of not herding um, in a pretty significant way. Um, the fact that so many polls, you know, coincided in terms of um, the levels that Biden and Trump had running into election day and that they were as a whole proven so wrong, I think, you know, it, it should really stimulate further research into this. Uh, try to under, uh, we should try to understand um, what is happening here because poll herding was pretty significant in this cycle. Uh, that's all for me. That was great. Thank you very much. I know Blake has a, a question, but I just wanted to, again, say thank you to you both. I think it was a spectacular depiction of um, uh, showing 
having some humility about where things went right, where things went wrong. Uh, Emerson team, I sincerely appreciated all the nuance and, and openness uh, into what you shared. And Andre, your, your kind of three point breakdown uh, about the factors of 2020, I think uh, give a much more illustrative depiction than, than that A4 uh, report does. But Blake, you had a, you had a question uh, about turnout, I think. Uh, yeah, so um, the last election, I had a lot of friends that normally didn't vote, but did vote just because like, I guess the Trump effect is what you would call it. Um, do you think if he doesn't run in 2022, do you think we'd still see that kind of like turnout or do you think it'll kind of go back to normal? Um, it's hard to figure out what's back to normal anymore these days, you know, because things are, you know, our societies are changing in, in, in such dramatic fashion. Um, it used to be the case in U.S. elections that you had a very small contingent of Hispanic voters, for example. That's mm -hmm. that's no longer the case. It used to be the case that Hispanic voters w used to vote at a much lower rate uh, than other racial groups. That's also really not uh, no longer the case, I, I, I think. Um, and so, you know, figuring out what's the normal, <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. even that is 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 kind of a challenge, right? Um, in terms of my expectations for, for the next uh, U.S. race, um, I think th Trump voters will be extremely mobilized. Um, I, 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 I continue to see, you know, a, a huge degree of political polarization in American society. Um, and at the margin, um, I, I, I believe that the risk in, in the next election is polls getting the election wrong because of demobilization by the Biden base rather than anything else happening with the Trump base. So I would see, you know, the Trump base more of a constant in terms of um, behavior uh, and the potential surprise could come from demobilization uh, on, on the left side. Uh, but that's, you know, very, you know, speculative early on assessment of an event that's still very far away um, if the election happened tomorrow, that's, that's more or less what I would expect to see, but that doesn't mean that it's going to happen in the midterms or in the next presidential race. Cool. That makes perfect sense. Um, I want you both, all, both entities, all three of you back here a year from now to talk about uh, your accuracy for uh, <laughs> the primaries heading into the midterms at, at this point. If we do it again, in late September, early October, it'll be a perfect time right before the uh, the midterms. Uh, but thank you again, sincerely. And on behalf of the research industry, thank you for both being innovative and pushing us forward and not being stuck with what used to be, I think you guys both called uh, the gold standard and pushing it forward. So thank you very much and uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thanks, guys. Thanks so much, Adam. Thank Have you, thank you. Weekend, everyone.